In the name of Allah, the most merciful and kind, you are about to listen to an audio representation of the life of the Prophet Muhammad. It does not replace a thorough studying of his life. Now, sit back and enjoy the show. Chapter 1 The Black Stone The building in the center of the city of Mecca was the most important building in the entire world. Or at least it was to the residents of Mecca, and you really couldn't blame them for that assumption. Mecca wasn't much of a city to begin with, and anything that gave it some distinction made it worth glorifying. The ancient trading village was made of shabby mud huts that lined the valleys that were hundreds of miles from any real civilization. As far as the rest of humanity was concerned, there was nothing there but sand, sun, and savages. If you could miraculously find water out in the mountainous crevices and scorching sand dunes, it was probably going to be around Arab nomads and tribes. And, truth be told, the Arabs probably posed more of a threat to your life than the sun or the thirst. But if you were lucky enough to end up in Mecca, your saving grace was that very special building in the center of the city the most important building in the world, the Kaaba. In Arabic, Kaaba literally meant cube, a fitting name since the Kaaba was just a rectangular building of stone and mortar covered in multicolored drapes. According to the Arabs, the Kaaba was the house of Allah, the God in Arabic. Therefore, the Kaaba was holy and sacred, and everyone around the Kaaba was safe. You couldn't be robbed, killed, cheated on, kidnapped, or harmed in any way as long as you are next to the Kaaba. No other place offered such protection to an outsider. A man could go to the Kaaba and see the killer of his father standing right there, and he would not and could not touch him. The Kaaba was the oldest and biggest building in Mecca, and for as long as anyone could remember, it was the first shrine ever built to Allah. In fact, legend had it that the Prophet Ibrahim had built the Kaaba himself many centuries ago. It was so old that when the flash flood had hit the night before, the walls collapsed almost immediately. A recent fire and years of neglectful maintenance did not help its chances when the water washed down from the surrounding mountains and into the valley where Mecca was located. In the morning, the Meccans woke up and prepared to do their rituals at the Kaaba, circling its four corners chanting praises to Allah and the other deities they worship. Instead, they found the Kaaba, the house of God, the monument of Mecca, destroyed. The situation was very chaotic when Abu Talib arrived at the scene. The Kaaba courtyard was packed with tribesmen, merchants, children, warriors, slaves, priests, and even a few riding animals. Nobles were arguing, women were wailing, a practice reserved for calamities, and the city's poets were already beginning to devise lament poetry. The house of God has been destroyed. There's barely anything left of its standing. This is the bad luck from the crow I saw last week. What devil has brought this misfortune to us? The gods have abandoned us. A few pagan priests had gathered around a fallen idol, a statue of the god Manaf, and were trying to lift it up. They didn't notice Abu Talib approach. Ready, men. Let's move this quickly. One, two, three! Leave that statue where it is. The Kaaba is in ruin and you concern yourself with Manav? They dropped the statue. Abu Talib, my apologies. I did not see you there. A man of your nobility is deserving of respect. Abu Talib waved his hand dismissively. He wore robes that went down to his ankles, a brown turban, and carried a long wooden staff in his hand. Abu Talib carried a lot of respect in Mecca. He was the chief of the Banu Hashim clan, one of the most noble and powerful clans in Mecca. Mecca was ruled by 14 clans that made up the tribe of Quraysh. The clans varied in size, wealth, and nobility, but the Banu Hashim was the most honored among them. The tribe of Quraysh was in charge of the Kaaba and made its money selling to the pilgrims that came to the Kaaba every year. Abu Talib knew he had to act fast before the merchants began to panic. 
He approached the ruined building and stood in front of it. The crowd was hollering and arguing. Ah, Abu Talib, finally decided to arrive, have you? Blessed morning, Walid. Doesn't seem to be that way, Abu Talib. I was just about to address the people of Mecca about this predicament. Actually, Walid, I was going to make an announcement. Walid stared at Abu Talib in amusement. He was taller, but similar in age to Abu Talib. But he was the chief of the Banu Makhzum clan. The Banu Hashim and the Banu Makhzum clans were arch rivals, and naturally, Abu Talib and Walid ibn Mughira could barely stand each other. Abu Talib, do you not think it more prudent that the most noble member of Quraysh address the people? That's why he volunteered. Walid jumped slightly when he heard the booming voice of Abbas, Abu Talib's brother, next to him. Abbas approached the two of them. The Banu Makhzum are better equipped to handle this situation, Abbas. The Banu Hashim are just as equipped as you. Your chieftain is broke. But the rest of our clan is not. I am the greatest poet in Arabia. And you're gonna rebuild the Kaaba with rhymes? Our clan is noble and we were here first. Our father defended the Kaaba when nobody else would. Do you not think it more prudent that his sons rebuild it today? They glared at each other. Walid had to admit to himself. Though he despised the Banu Hashim clan, Abu Talib was right about their history with the Kaaba. Oh, very well, Abu Talib. Take the sons of Hashim's glory as you always do. Abu Talib gave a respectful nod and turned to the crowd. A few people were watching him, awaiting orders, but most were arguing and panicking loudly. Abbas, if you please. Abbas grumbled. He was infamous for having the loudest voice in Mecca. Silence! The effect was instantaneous. The sea of people fell silent and all eyes turned to Abu Talib. Sons of Adnan! As you can see, the Kaaba is in disrepair. Disrepair? Woe to you! It's completely destroyed! Yeah! This was bad luck. Someone rode a hummy horse or ignored some other bad omen. What honor do we have if we cannot protect the house of Allah? Ha! <laughs> no less honor than the Banu Nofal already have. Oh, very rich words from the fools from the Banu Abdishems! A fistfight broke out between the two tribesmen. The commotion returned as quickly as it had left. From the corner of his eye, Abu Talib could see Walid smirk. Silence! Thank you, Abbas. O oh, tribe of Quraysh, we cannot let our feuds disunite us. We have a duty as custodians of the Kaaba to rebuild the holy sanctuary. Each clan will elect a chief to join me to convene at Dar and Nadwa so that we may devise a plan to rebuild the house of Allah. Who will join me? Walid spoke up. The Banu Makhzum. <laughs> the Banu Nofal. <laughs> the Banu Taim. <laughs> the Banu Habdishams. <laughs> Soon, all 14 of the clans had elected a leader to convene at Dar al Nadwa. Abu Talib led the ensemble of people who paraded through the narrow streets of Mecca, some banging drums, others ululating until the chieftains arrived at Dar al Nadwa. Dar al Nadwa was a low wall that ran a wide circle, a campfire in the middle, and a high palm leaf ceiling. This was where the tribe of Quraysh met to govern and make decisions. Those decisions usually boiled down to war. War was extremely easy to start in Arabia. A tribal war had once started between two clans over a camel and lasted decades before subsiding. Abu Talib wanted to avoid war at all costs. He hoped to Allah that the chieftains would be sensible enough to rebuild the Kaaba without any need for conflict. Settle down, my noble comrades. Excellent speech, Abu Talib. If I did not know better, I would have assumed the Banu Hashim had eloquent speakers. 
Abu Talib was really tempted to ad-lib some lines of poetry at Walid to show him true eloquence. He was a skilled poet himself, but now is not the time for rivalry. Let us address the matter at hand. How do we rebuild the Kaaba? Why don't we just use the same stone it was built with? Most of the bricks are either too old or cracked. Besides, I think this is a great opportunity for us to make improvements to the structure. New bricks, a roof, new locks, and make the door higher off the ground so we do not have thieves trying to take the treasure within. There were murmurs of agreement. None of us are that skilled in construction, nor do we have the material. One of Walid's slave girls was serving wine to the chiefs. While she did this, a younger nobleman spoke up. I know of a Greek ship that was headed for Yemen. Caesar sent it stocked with material for a church. You want to steal from the Romans? I doubt that will be necessary. The ship was hit by a storm and is stuck in Judda. Word in the desert is that the architect is trying to sell the wood, the marble, all the material. So let us hire him. Send riders to Judah. Bring back all the material. With whose money? Definitely not you, Abu Talib. We all know of your financial situation. This time, it was Abbas that had to restrain himself to Walid's comments. We should fundraise the money from all of Quraysh. No, all of Mecca. Our clan will dedicate funds as well. And ours. Do not forget the Banu Taim. Wait. O oh, people of Quraysh, this is a noble cause. So the money must come from pure sources. No hire of harlots, no ill-gotten gains, thievery, or gambling. Then let us take an oath. We shall work together to build the Kaaba. And so they made the arrangement. Walid ibn Mughira sent his son with a few riders to Judda to pick up the architect and material. Abu Hakam, Walid's right-hand man, began walking through the streets of Mecca, fundraising for the rebuilding of the Kaaba. Money! Money for the reconstruction of the House of Allah! Place your dinars and dirhams here! Yeah, yeah, you heard him! Put the money in the bag! Ubay, you're collecting donations as well? Huh? Donations? I thought we were robbing people. No, you fool. We can rob people some other time. I'm collecting donations for the Kaaba. Your tribe is from nobility. Would you like to donate? Oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I have a bag of gold right here. The money must be from pure sources. Huh? What do you mean, pure sources? As in no gambling, interest, prostitution, thievery. You know what I mean. Oh. Ubay paused for a few seconds, then proceeded to drop one coin into Abu Hakam's bag. Meanwhile, many of the other tribes were at the Kaaba ruin. They wanted to clear the debris and demolish what was left of the Kaaba to make way for the construction. But nobody seemed to want to be the first to intentionally harm the structure. This feels wrong. We have to destroy the old to build the new. What if Allah curses us for destroying the sacred house? What are you men afraid of? Allow me! One man approached, looking determined. He picked up a stone from the structure, but to his astonishment, the stone leapt out of his grip and flew back to its previous location. He blinked at the miracle he just witnessed. By Allah! What is- <gasps> He reeled back in horror. A long, thick, black serpent emerged from under one of the bricks. The crowd gasped and took several steps back in shock. Rumors had previously been spread about a snake residing under the Kaaba. Several pilgrims had reported hearing hissing while circling around it. And now, it seemed the rumors were true. See? Allah sends a snake to protect the Kaaba. He is sending us a message. We should not touch a single stone. Did you see it fly from his hand? What do we do? Suddenly, a falcon dived from the sky and swept the snake away in its talons. The crowd stood dumbfounded. Well, now what message is he sending us? Perhaps that he is giving us permission? or warning us of destruction. Remember what happened in the year of the elephant. I am not moving one stone. Neither am I. When nobody else said anything, Walid, in exasperation, cried, Very well, if none of you are brave enough, I shall do it. Slave, hand me a hatchet. 
The slave nervously handed Walid the hatchet. Oh Allah, my lord, you know I only strike your holy sanctuary to rebuild it. I mean no harm. He took a swing at the foundation. A cloud of dust emerged. The crowd watched on in apprehension. When nothing happened, Walid swung again and again. It's perfect. If nothing happens to Walid, we'll know it's safe for us. And sure enough, when Walid ibn Mughira showed up in the city center the next morning, completely safe and definitely not destroyed, more and more people gained the courage to begin clearing the compound. Meanwhile, Abu Talib, Abbas, and some other chiefs had devised a plan of construction. They would group several tribes together and assign the construction of each section of the Kaaba to one group. This was to ensure that each clan of Quraysh had some claim to the construction of the Kaaba. The idea was met with enthusiasm. Each clan was given a section of the Kaaba to construct as soon as the old structure was clear. Abu Talib, however, was still bothered by a nagging concern. Nobody had mentioned it in any of the meetings but he knew it would come up eventually. A part of him was still hoping, though, that if he didn't address it, it wouldn't be an issue. Walid's eldest son returned only a few days later with a Roman mason named Bakum, one of the few survivors of the shipwreck. Through a translator who conveyed from Arabic to Latin, they were able to communicate what they wanted from him. After looking at the crude drawing they made of the new Kaaba, he responded by saying that it would cost some money. Abu Hakam, eager after several weeks of fundraising, presented the donations. Will this be enough? Bakum smiled. No translator was needed to explain his answer. Back at the Kaaba, the men had managed to clear much of the debris. They had toiled for several days, working from dawn till midday, then retreating to their dwellings to avoid the desert sun. They lifted the stones on their shoulders, and when their shoulders began to hurt, they shamelessly removed their lower garments and patted their shoulders under the weight of the stones, revealing their naked lower bodies. As they cleared more and more of the debris, the men got closer to the base of the Kaaba and unearthed what seemed to be round, flat, slightly green-colored stones. One tribe's men dug his staff under one of the stones and tried to dislodge it. The earth beneath them shook and trembled. The men panicked. Stop, you fool! The man removed the staff and the trembling subsided. Glory to Allah, I, I beg your forgiveness. None shall dig any further. We have reached the base. Abu Talib watched from a distance as the construction proceeded a few days later. Though far from complete, the new Kaaba was stunning. Its fine stone and expert masonry were a stark contrast to the shabby mud structures, tents and huts that made up the rest of the city of Mecca. Bakum had informed them through rough translations that they hadn't raised enough money to construct the Kaaba as big as they had wanted, so they were forced to downsize slightly. Abu Talib and the rest of the chieftains did not argue. Anything to avoid conflict. Anything to avoid the clan starting another pointless blood feud. Abu Talib was determined to make this a peaceful endeavor. He held in his hand a delicate manuscript made of thin, worn-out leather. One of the tribes had unearthed it while clearing the Kaaba. It seemed centuries old, and he could barely make out what seemed to be writing. Abu Talib had stared at it blankly, but came to the conclusion that it wasn't written in Arabic. Not that that made any difference. Abu Talib could not read, nor could most of the population of Mecca. The Jews of Yathrib often mocked them for being illiterate. Perhaps he could show the manuscript to one of them if they ever stopped by Mecca. Everyone knew how educated the Jews were, but Abu Talib cared less about what the manuscript said and more about the unaddressed issue. As they got closer and closer to completing the Kaaba, he knew that it would come up eventually. And sure enough, it did. It all started one morning. A member from the Banu Hashim and a member from the Banu Makhzum, both working on their respective walls, the eastern and southern sides that made a corner of the Kaaba. The Hashemite casually walked over to the round, smooth stone that was sitting on a pile of palm leaves. It was jet black and an almost completely perfect orb. To an outsider, it would have seemed as though all of Mecca didn't even notice it. But the truth was that this stone was the most valuable thing in all of Mecca. Everyone had purposely ignored it for weeks, not wanting to be the first to acknowledge the problem, as though delaying it would make it go away. What do you think you're doing, son of Hashim? I am building our side of the sanctuary, son of Mukzum. 
What gives you the right to place the Black Stone? It is on our side of the Sacred House. No, it is on our clan's side of the Sacred House. More clansmen arrived at the scene. A caller cried out. The Benu Hashim are trying to steal the Black Stone! Two crowds quickly formed on either side of the Black Stone. Nobody knew where the Black Stone originally came from. It had been part of the Kaaba for centuries, older than any of the residents of Mecca. It was passed down from previous generations that the Black Stone was the only piece of the Kaaba that was part of the original structure built by Ibrahim. To every Arab, the city of Mecca was the holiest city, and the Kaaba was the holiest building in Mecca. But the Black Stone? The Black Stone was the holiest part of the Kaaba, and perhaps the whole world. You will not have the honor of placing the Black Stone. You have no right to put your hands on it. Walid and Abu Hakim showed up. It's the stone for us, or the sword for you. Your choice, Banu Hashim. We have swords for every one of you, Banu Makhzum. Stop! The crowd parted for Abu Talib. No one lay a finger on the black stone. Walid, join me, and the rest of the chiefs at Darun Dadwa. We can sort this out. He almost pleaded with Walid ibn Mughira. Not this time, Abu Talib. Your clan has always had every honor. But today, my clan gets this. He spat viciously. Why simply you then? The Banu Taim are from the sons of Adnan just like your clans. Another chief exclaimed. All right, all right. We'll settle this. The Banu Abd Shems takes the black stone and... Abu Hakim drew his sword. All around him, men from different tribes did the same. It was Abu Talib's worst fears realized. He tried pleading with the other chieftains. He tried compromising. For three days he tried to convene talks, but it was no use. His clan would not compromise, and Walid's clan made it very clear. They either got their way, or it was war. The other clans, eager to bolster their integrity and clout, also took uncompromising stances. On the second day, people showed up to the nearly completed Kaaba in full armor. On the third day, Abu Hakam made a blood oath with his tribe, each cutting their hand and wiping blood on an animal skin. None of them could write, so the blood acted as a signature. You swear to give up your lives for the sake of your clan? Yeah! You swear that you will not sheathe your swords until we have the honor of placing the black stone on the sacred house? Yeah! And you swear that if we fight those dirty Hashemites, you will not rest till you've killed every last one of them? On the fourth day, Abu Talib watched Abbas sharpen his sword. His other brothers donned armor, and a small militia of archers filled their quiver. Abbas, there must be another way. We must avoid war. I don't like it either, brother, but we must protect the honor of our clan. The morning of the fifth day. Dawn. Nobody slept the night before. The clans emerged from their denizens. The clink of armor could be heard. Slaves carried arms to their masters. The Banu Adi rode horses. The Banu Sehem carried spears. The Banu Makhzum wore leopard skins, a symbol of war. And every tribe was ready for battle. And so they solemnly marched out of their valleys towards the inevitable bloodbath. The irony was, the Kaaba was a sanctuary. Nobody could be killed near it. And here they were, marching to slaughter each other for it. Abu Talib felt helpless as he marched with his family, side by side with the other clans, all headed for the appointed battlefield. Abu Talib began to sing some lines of poetry, a classic poem about war. If we were men, maidens you, we would not do this act to you, so die with honor. Or slay your foe And light the flames of war With scorching wood And if you're not Enraged by so Then be like women With their cool good And die with honor Die with honor Last chance, Abu 
Tell your men to stand down, and you may return to your homes with your lives. The Banu Hashim will never stand down, Walid. Everyone began to advance. Everyone, stop! The armies halted. What now? Who dares address us in this way? The voice came from a man whose head and face were wrapped in a turban. He was mounted on a camel, and steered it where the most number of people could see him. Slowly, he unwrapped his face. It is I, Hudayfa ibn Mugira. The crowd looked dumbfounded. Walid, clad in armor, spoke up immediately. Brother, what do you think you are? Silence, Walid, you fool! Your stupidity is going to get everyone killed! Walid looked flustered. His older brother was the eldest man in Mecca, far older than him or Abu Talib. He couldn't answer back to him. Men of Quraysh, I do not have many years left to live, and I will not see my tribe shed blood so trivially. It is true, I wish my clan to be the one to fit the Black Stone, but not if the Black Stone is smeared in blood. He glared at Abu Hakam, who looked away, embarrassed. Then what is the solution? In matters like these, let the gods decide. Lock of the draw. The first man to enter upon the sanctuary decides who places the black stone. There was a fleeting moment, the smallest unit of time imaginable, where the world was quiet and calm after Hodefa finished his words. And then... stampede erupted. The clans merged and mixed together so that they were one rampaging wave of eagerness. Every man running at top speed, desperate to be the first to reach the Kaaba. Abu Hakam shoved people out of his way. The Banu Adi horses jostled through the crowd. A cloud of dust rose behind them. Abu Talib ran faster than he had since he was a young man. There were many gates to the Kaaba compound, each belonging to a different clan, but nobody seemed to care which gate they entered. Abu Talib sprinted past Dar al Nadwa. He was panting. He could see the Kaaba with his own eyes. There were too many people. Everyone was going to arrive at once. This solution solved nothing. But before despair could wash over him... Look, someone is already here! The crowd stopped at once. The Kaaba was surrounded by a sea of people. The black stone was still resting on its spot. And right at the Kaaba was a man on his knees with a white turban. He had his back to the crowd. He was touching the Kaaba with one hand, quietly praying. Everyone was silent. They slowly approached him. Abu Hakam had his hand on the hilt of his sword. Remembering his blood oath, he whispered to Walid, If he is anyone outside of our clan, we start swinging. The shrouded figure arose and turned around, his face covered by his turban. The anticipation was palpable. Any minute, a battle was going to break out. Abu Talib's eyes were wide. Is it? The man faced the crowd and unveiled his face. It's Muhammad! The honest one! And trustworthy! It is Muhammad! It's him! The honest and trustworthy one is here! But you know our tribe is deserving of this. He is here! You love my tribe. Choose us! Muhammad looked shocked at the cheering. He looked at Abu Talib about to ask what was going on, but was bombarded by the onlookers. Muhammad, you love my tribe, choose us! Oh Muhammad, you know our clan deserves this, you are a man of justice! It took some time for everyone to settle. When everyone was quiet enough, Abbas explained to Muhammad the dilemma. Muhammad stared intently at Abbas, absorbing every word he said. When he had finished, Muhammad paused, not saying a word. Then he turned towards the direction of the black stone. The crowd followed him. Muhammad stared at the black stone and saw his reflection on its surface. Finally, he turned to the crowd, not raising his voice but still managing to be heard. He articulated clearly and concisely. Bring me a garment. The crowd turned around. A man promptly removed his undergarment, revealing his naked underbody. Muhammad grimaced at the indecency and took the shawl that was offered to him from another man instead. He spread it on the ground, picked up the black stone delicately, and put it in the center of the shawl. Clans of Quraysh, bring forth your leaders, he said.
people began to catch on to what Muhammad's idea was. The chieftains, Abu Talib and Walid included, each approached the shawl with the black stone in the center. Muhammad instructed them to each hold one part of the cloth. Together, the chieftains lifted the black stone and carried it like a king on a suspended throne. The procession followed them until they reached the new Kaaba. They moved the cloth closer and closer to the empty hole in the corner of the Kaaba. The chiefs were beaming. They began to turn the cloth vertically towards the Kaaba. The stone gently rolled down the shawl and finally, Muhammad himself placed the black stone firmly back into its place in the most important building in the entire world. There were no words to describe the humiliation. The chiefs, who were nearly all old men, were jumping up and down in celebration like children. The women were eulating, people were beating drums. All praise be to Allah. Praises to Allah, we did it. You noble man, you saved Arrow us. Arrow Muhammad, the most honest man in all of Mecca. Muhammad smiled so widely that the back of his teeth could be seen. It was so contagious that even the usually stoic Abbas was laughing like never before. Abu Hakim was relieved that his blood oath had technically been fulfilled, as his tribe had placed the black stone back into the Kaaba. Everyone wanted a turn to shake Muhammad's hand, ruffle his hair, hug him, congratulate him. But finally, he came face to face with Abu Talib. There were tears in his eyes, and he rested his frail hands on his staff as he looked at Muhammad with pure adoration. Well done, my nephew. Well done. All praise and thanks belongs to Allah, Muhammad responded pleasantly. His reputation was unmatched, his honesty well known, and trust reliable. His oaths were never broken, his kindness second to none. And on that fateful day, Muhammad was even more beloved to his people than ever before. Despite all that, however, despite all the praise, congratulating and celebrating, nobody present that day, not Abu Talib, Abbas, Walid, or even Muhammad himself could ever know that in just a few short years, the very same people who were celebrating his name would be trying to kill him.